Book Two, Chapter Three, Part Two of Two of The Beautiful and Damned. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Beautiful and Damned by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Book Two, Chapter Three The Broken Lute. Part Two of Two. The Apartment. After the sureties of youth, there sets in a period of intense and intolerable complexity. With the soda jerker, this period is so short as to be almost negligible. Men higher in this scale hold out longer in the attempt to preserve the ultimate niceties of relationship, to retain impractical ideas of integrity. But by the late twenties, the business has grown too intricate, and what has hitherto been imminent and confusing has become gradually remote and dim. Routine comes down like twilight on a harsh landscape, softening it until it is tolerable. The complexity is too subtle, too varied. The values are changing utterly with each lesion of vitality. It has begun to appear that we can learn nothing from the past with which to face the future, so we cease to be impulsive, convincible men, interested in what is ethically true by fine margins. We substitute rules of conduct for ideas of integrity, we value safety above romance, we become, quite unconsciously, pragmatic. It is left to the few to be persistently concerned with the nuances of relationships, and even this few only in certain hours especially set aside for the task. Anthony Patch had ceased to be an individual of mental adventure, of curiosity, and had become an individual of bias and prejudice, with a longing to be emotionally undisturbed. This gradual change had taken place through the past several years, accelerated by a succession of anxieties preying on his mind. There was, first of all, the sense of waste, always dormant in his heart, now awakened by the circumstances of his position. In his moments of insecurity, he was haunted by the suggestion that life might be, after all, significant. In his early twenties, the conviction of the futility of effort, of the wisdom of abnegation, had been confirmed by the philosophies he had admired, as well as by his association with Maury Noble, and later with his wife. Yet there had been occasions, just before his first meeting with Gloria, for example, and when his grandfather had suggested he should go abroad, as a war correspondent, upon which his dissatisfaction had driven him almost to a positive step. One day, just before they left Marietta for the last time, carelessly turning over the pages of a Harvard alumni bulletin, he had found a column which told him what his contemporaries had been about in this six years since graduation. Most of them were in business, it was true, and several were converting the heathen of China or America to a nebulous Protestantism. But a few, he found, were working constructively at jobs that were neither sinecures nor routines, there was Calvin Boyd, for instance, who, though barely out of medical school, had discovered a new treatment for typhus, had shipped abroad, and was mitigating some of the civilization that the great powers had brought to Servia. There was Eugene Bronson, whose articles in the New Democracy were stamping him as a man with ideas transcending both vulgar timelines and popular hysteria. There was a man named Daly, who had been suspended from the faculty of a righteous university, for preaching Marxian doctrines in the classroom. In art, science, politics, he saw the authentic personalities of his time emerging. There was even Severance, the quarterback, who had given up his life rather neatly and gracefully with the Foreign Legion on the Aisne. He laid down the magazine and thought for a while about these diverse men. In the days of his integrity, he would have defended his attitude to the last, an Epicurus in Nirvana, he would have cried that to struggle was to believe, to believe was to limit. He would as soon have become a churchgoer because the prospect of immortality gratified him as he would have considered entering the leather business because the intensity of the competition would have kept him from unhappiness. But at present he had no such delicate scruples. This autumn, as his twenty-ninth year began, he was inclined to close his mind to many things, to avoid prying deeply into motives and first causes, and mostly to long passionately for security from the world and from himself. He hated to be alone. 
as has been said, he often dreaded being alone with Gloria. Because of this chasm which his grandfather's visit had opened before him, and the consequent revulsion from his late mode of life, it was inevitable that he should look around in this suddenly hostile city for the friends and environments that had once seemed the warmest and most secure. His first step was a desperate attempt to get back his old apartment. In the spring of 1912 he had signed a four-year lease at 1700 a year with an option of renewal. This lease had expired the previous May. When he had first rented the rooms, they had been mere potentialities, scarcely to be discerned as that, but Anthony had seen into these potentialities and arranged in the lease that he and the landlord should each spend a certain amount in improvements. Rents had gone up in the past four years, and last spring, when Anthony had waived his option, the landlord, a Mr. Sewenberg, had realized that he could get a much bigger price for what was now a prepossessing apartment. Accordingly, when Anthony approached him on the subject in September, he was met with Sewenberg's offer of a three-year lease at twenty-five hundred a year. This, it seemed to Anthony, was outrageous. It meant that well over a third of their income would be consumed in rent. In vain, he argued that his own money, his own ideas in the repartitioning, had made the rooms attractive. In vain, he offered two thousand dollars, twenty-two hundred, though they could ill afford it. Mr. Sewenberg was obdurate. It seemed that two other gentlemen were considering it. Just that sort of an apartment was in demand at the moment, and it would scarcely be business to give it to Mr. Patch. Besides, though he had never mentioned it before, several of the other tenants had complained of noise during the previous winter, singing and dancing late at night, that sort of thing. Internally raging, Anthony hurried back to the Ritz to report his discomfiture to Gloria. "'I can just see you,' she stormed, letting him back you down. "'What could I say? You could have told him what he was. I wouldn't have stood it. No other man in the world would have stood it. You just let people order you around and cheat you and bully you and take advantage of you as if you were a silly little boy. It's absurd.' "'Oh, for heaven's sake, don't lose your temper. I know, Anthony, but you are such an ass.' Well, possibly. Anyway, we can't afford that apartment, but we can afford it better than living here at the Ritz. You were the one who insisted on coming here. Yes, because I knew you'd be miserable in a cheap hotel. Of course I would. At any rate, we've got to find a place to live. How much can we pay? she demanded. Well, we can pay even his price if we sell more bonds, but we agreed last night that until I had gotten something definite to do, we— Oh, I know all that. I asked you how much we can pay out of just our income. They say you ought not to pay more than a fourth. How much is a fourth? One hundred and fifty a month. Do you mean to say we've only got six hundred dollars coming in every month? A subdued note crept into her voice. Of course, he answered angrily. Do you think we've gone on spending more than twelve thousand a year without cutting way into our capital? I knew we'd sold bonds, but have we spent that much a year? How did we? Her awe increased. Oh, I'll look in those careful account books we kept, he remarked ironically, then added, two rents a good part of the time, clothes, travel, why, each of those springs in California cost about four thousand dollars. That darn car was an expense from start to finish, and parties and amusements and, oh, one thing and another." They were both excited now, and inordinately depressed. The situation seemed worse in the actual telling Gloria than it had when he had first made the discovery himself. "'You've got to make some money,' she said suddenly. "'I know it.' "'And you've got to make another attempt to see your grandfather.' "'I will. "'When?' "'When we get settled.' This eventuality occurred a week later. They rented a small apartment on 57th Street at 150 a month. It included bedroom, living room, kitchenette, and bath in a thin, white stone apartment house. And though the rooms were too small to display Anthony's best furniture, they were clean, new, and, in a blonde and sanitary way, not unattractive. Bounds had gone abroad to enlist in the British Army, and in his place they tolerated, rather than enjoyed, the services of a gaunt, big-boned Irish woman, whom Gloria loathed because she discussed the glories of Sinn Féin as she served breakfast. 
but they had vowed they would have no more Japanese, and English servants were for the present hard to obtain. Like Bounds, the women prepared only breakfast. Their other meals they took at restaurants and hotels. What finally drove Anthony post-haste up to Tarrytown was an announcement in several New York papers that Adam Patch, the multimillionaire, the philanthropist, the venerable uplifter, was seriously ill and not expected to recover. The Kitten Anthony could not see him. The doctor's instructions were that he was to talk to no one, said Mr. Shuttleworth, who offered kindly to take any message that Anthony might care to entrust with him and deliver it to Adam Patch when his condition permitted. But by obvious innuendo, he confirmed Anthony's melancholy inference that the prodigal grandson would be particularly unwelcome at the bedside. At one point in the conversation, Anthony, with Gloria's positive instructions in mind, made a move as though to brush by the secretary, but Shuttleworth, with a smile, squared his brawny shoulders, and Anthony saw how futile such an attempt would be. Miserably intimidated, he returned to New York, where husband and wife passed a restless week. A little incident that occurred one evening indicated to what tension their nerves were drawn. Walking home along a cross street after dinner, Anthony noticed a night-bound cat prowling near a railing. "'I always have an instinct to kick a cat,' he said idly. "'I like them. I yielded to it once. When? Oh, years ago, before I met you. One night between the acts of a show, cold night, like this, and I was a little tight, one of the first times I was ever tight,' he added. The poor little beggar was looking for a place to sleep, I guess, and I was in a mean mood, so it took my fancy to kick it. "'Oh, the poor kitty!' cried Gloria, sincerely moved. Inspired with the narrative instinct, Anthony enlarged on the theme. "'It was pretty bad,' he admitted. The poor little beast turned around and looked at me rather plaintively, as though hoping I'd pick him up and be kind to him. He was really just a kitten.' and before he knew it, a big foot launched out at him and caught his little back. Oh! Gloria's cry was full of anguish. It was such a cold night, he continued perversely, keeping his voice upon a melancholy tone. I guess it expected kindness from somebody, and it got only pain. He broke off suddenly. Gloria was sobbing. They had reached home, and when they entered the apartment, she threw herself upon the lounge, crying as though he had struck at her very soul. "'Oh, the poor little kitty!' she repeated piteously. "'The poor little kitty, so cold. "'Gloria, don't come near me! "'Please, don't come near me! "'You killed the soft little kitty!' "'Touched, Anthony knelt beside her. "'Dear,' he said. "'Oh, Gloria, darling, it isn't true. "'I invented it, every word of it.' "'But she would not believe him. "'There had been something in the details he had chosen to describe "'that made her cry herself to sleep that night.' for the kitten, for Anthony, for herself, for the pain and bitterness and cruelty of all the world. The Passing of an American Moralist Old Adam died on a midnight of late November with a pious compliment to his God on his thin lips. He, who had been flattered so much, faded out flattering the omnipotent abstraction, which he fancied he might have angered in the more lascivious moments of his youth. It was announced that he had arranged some sort of an armistice with the deity, the terms of which were not made public, though they were thought to have included a large cash payment. All the newspapers printed his biography, and two of them ran short editorials on his sterling worth, and his part in the drama of industrialism, with which he had grown up. They referred guardedly to the reforms he had sponsored and financed, the memories of Comstock and Cato the Censor were resuscitated and paraded like gaunt ghosts through the columns. Every newspaper remarked that he was survived by a single grandson, Anthony Comstock Patch, of New York. The burial took place in the family plot at Tarrytown. Anthony and Gloria rode in the first carriage, too worried to feel grotesque, both trying desperately to glean presage of fortune from the faces of retainers who had been with him at the end. They waited a frantic week for decency, and then, having received no notification of any kind, Anthony called up his grandfather's lawyer. Mr. Brett was not in. He was expected back in an hour. 
Anthony left his telephone number. It was the last day of November, cool and crackling outside, with a lusterless sun peering bleakly in at the windows. While they waited for the call, ostensibly engaged in reading, the atmosphere, within and without, seemed pervaded with a deliberate rendition of the pathetic fallacy. After an interminable while, the bell jingled, and Anthony, starting violently, took up the receiver. Hello? His voice was strained and hollow. Yes, I did leave word. Who is this, please? Yes. Why, it was about the estate. Naturally, I'm interested, and I've received no word about the reading of the will. I thought you might not have my address. What? Yes. Gloria fell on her knees. The intervals between Anthony's speeches were like tourniquets winding on her heart. She found herself helplessly twisting the large buttons from a velvet cushion. Then, that's, that's very, very odd. That's very odd. That's very odd. Not even any, uh, mention or any, uh, reason? His voice sounded faint and far away. She uttered a little sound, half gasp, half cry. Yes, I'll see. All right, thanks, thanks. The phone clicked. Her eyes, looking along the floor, saw his feet cut the pattern of a patch of sunlight on the carpet. She arose and faced him with a gray, level glance just as his arms folded about her. "'My dearest,' he whispered huskily, "'he did it, God damn him.'" Next Day "'Who are the heirs?' asked Mr. Haight. "'You see, when you can tell me so little about it—' Mr. Haight was tall and bent and beetle-browed. He had been recommended to Anthony as an astute and tenacious lawyer. I only know vaguely, answered Anthony, a man named Shuttleworth, who was a sort of pet of his, has the whole thing in charge as administrator or trustee or something, all except the direct bequests to charity and the provisions for servants and for those two cousins in Idaho. How distant are the cousins? Oh, third or fourth, anyway. I never even heard of them. Mr. Haight nodded comprehensively. And you want to contest a provision of the will? I guess so, admitted Anthony, helplessly. I want to do what sounds most hopeful. That's what I want you to tell me. You want them to refuse probate to the will? Anthony shook his head. You've got me. I haven't any idea what probate is. I want a share of the estate. Suppose you tell me some more details. For instance, do you know why the testator disinherited you? Why, yes, began Anthony. You see, he was always a sucker for moral reform and all that. I know, interjected Mr. Haight humorlessly. And I don't suppose he ever thought I was much good. I didn't go into business, you see. But I feel certain that, up to last summer, I was one of the beneficiaries. We had a house out in Marietta, and one night Grandfather got the notion that he'd come over and see us. It just happened that there was a rather gay party going on, and he arrived without any warning. Well, he took one look he and this fellow Shuttleworth, and then turned around and tore right back to Tarrytown. After that, he never answered my letters or even let me see him. He was a prohibitionist, wasn't he? He was everything. Regular religious maniac. How long before his death was the will made that disinherited you? Recently. I mean, since August. And you think that the direct reason for his not leaving you the majority of his estate was his displeasure with your recent actions? Yes. Mr. Haight considered. Upon what grounds was Anthony thinking of contesting the will? Why, isn't there something about evil influence? Undue influence is one ground, but it's the most difficult. You would have to show that such pressure was brought to bear so that the deceased was in a condition where he disposed of his property contrary to his intentions. Well, suppose this fellow Shuttleworth dragged him over to Marietta, just when he thought some sort of a celebration was probably going on. That wouldn't have any bearing on the case. There's a strong division between advice and influence. You'd have to prove that the secretary had a sinister intention. I'd suggest some other grounds. A will is automatically refused probate in case of insanity, drunkenness, here Anthony smiled, or feeble-mindedness through premature old age. But, objected Anthony, his private physician, being one of the beneficiaries, would testify that he wasn't feeble-minded and he wasn't. 
As a matter of fact, he probably did just what he intended to with his money. It was perfectly consistent with everything he'd ever done in his life. Well, you see, feeble-mindedness is a great deal like undue influence. It implies that the property wasn't disposed of as originally intended. The most common ground is duress, physical pressure. Anthony shook his head. Not much chance on that, I'm afraid. Undue influence sounds best to me. After more discussion, so technical as to be largely unintelligible to Anthony, he retained Mr. Haight as counsel. The lawyer proposed an interview with Shuttleworth, who, jointly with Wilson, Hymer, and Hardy, was executor of the will. Anthony was to come back later in the week. It transpired that the estate consisted of approximately forty million dollars. The largest bequest to an individual was of one million to Edward Shuttleworth, who received in addition thirty thousand a year salary as administrator of the thirty million dollar trust fund, left to be doled out to various charities and reform societies practically at his own discretion. The remaining nine millions were proportioned among the two cousins in Idaho and about twenty-five other beneficiaries, friends, secretaries, servants, and employees, who had, at one time or another, earned the seal of Adam Patch's approval. At the end of another fortnight, Mr. Haight, on a retainer's fee of fifteen thousand dollars, had begun preparations for contesting the will. THE WINTER OF DISCONTENT Before they had been two months in the little apartment on 57th Street, it had assumed for both of them the same indefinable but almost material taint that had impregnated the grey house in Marietta. There was the odor of tobacco, always. Both of them smoked incessantly. It was in their clothes, their blankets, the curtains, and the ash-littered carpets. Added to this was the wretched aura of stale wine, with its inevitable suggestion of beauty gone foul and revelry remembered in disgust. About a particular set of glass goblets on the sideboard, the odor was particularly noticeable, and in the main room the mahogany table was ringed with white circles where glasses had been set down upon it. There had been many parties. People broke things, people became sick in Gloria's bathroom, people spilled wine, people made unbelievable messes of the kitchenette. These things were a regular part of their existence. Despite the resolutions of many Mondays, it was tacitly understood, as the weekend approached, that it should be observed with some sort of unholy excitement. When Saturday came, they would not discuss the matter, but would call up this person or that, from among their circle of sufficiently irresponsible friends, and suggest a rendezvous. Only after the friends had gathered, and Anthony had set out decanters, would he murmur casually, I guess I'll have just one highball myself. Then they were off for two days, realizing, on a wintry dawn, that they had been the noisiest and most conspicuous members of the noisiest and most conspicuous party at the Boul Mitch or the Club Ramay, or at other resorts much less particular about the hilarity of their clientele. They would find that they had, somehow, squandered eighty or ninety dollars, how they never knew. They customarily attributed it to the general penury of the friends who had accompanied them. It began to be not unusual for the more sincere of their friends to remonstrate with them, in the very course of a party, and to predict a somber end for them in the loss of Gloria's looks and Anthony's constitution. The story of the summarily interrupted revel in Marietta had, of course, leaked out in detail. Muriel doesn't mean to tell everyone she knows, said Gloria to Anthony, but she thinks everyone she tells is the only one she's going to tell. And, diaphanously veiled, the tale had been given a conspicuous place in the town tattle. When the terms of Adam Patch's will were made public, and the newspapers printed items concerning Anthony's suit, the story was beautifully rounded out to Anthony's infinite disparagement. They began to hear rumors about themselves from all quarters, rumors founded usually on a soupçon of truth, but overlaid with preposterous and sinister detail. Outwardly, they showed no signs of deterioration. Gloria, at twenty-six, was still the Gloria of twenty, her complexion a fresh damp setting for her candid eyes, her hair still a childish glory, darkening slowly from corn color to a deep russet gold her slender body suggesting ever a nymph running and dancing through Orphic groves. Masculine eyes, dozens of them, 
followed her with a fascinated stare when she walked through a hotel lobby or down the aisle of a theater. Men asked to be introduced to her, fell into prolonged states of sincere admiration, made definite love to her, for she was still a thing of exquisite and unbelievable beauty. And for his part, Anthony had gained rather than lost in appearance. His face had taken on a certain intangible air of tragedy, romantically contrasted with his trim and immaculate person. Early in the winter, when all conversation turned on the probability of America's going into the war, when Anthony was making a desperate and sincere attempt to write, Muriel Kane arrived in New York and came immediately to see them. Like Gloria, she seemed never to change. She knew the latest slang, danced the latest dances, and talked of the latest songs and plays with all the fervor of her first season as a New York drifter. Her coyness was eternally new, eternally ineffectual, her clothes were extreme, her black hair was bobbed now, like Gloria's. "'I've come up for the midwinter prom at New Haven,' she announced, imparting her delightful secret. Though she must have been older then than any of the boys in college, she managed always to secure some sort of invitation, imagining vaguely that at the next party would occur the flirtation which was to end at the romantic altar. "'Where have you been?' inquired Anthony, unfailingly amused. "'I've been at Hot Springs. It's been slick and peppy this fall. More men!' "'Are you in love, Muriel?' "'What do you mean, love?' This was the rhetorical question of the year. "'I'm going to tell you something,' she said, switching the subject abruptly. "'I suppose it's none of my business, but I think it's time for you two to settle down.' "'Why, we are settled down.' "'Yes, you are.' she scoffed archly. Everywhere I go, I hear stories of your escapades. Let me tell you, I have an awful time sticking up for you. You needn't bother, said Gloria coldly. Now, Gloria, she protested, you know I'm one of your best friends. Gloria was silent. Muriel continued. It's not so much the idea of a woman drinking, but Gloria is so pretty, and so many people know her by sight all around, that it's naturally conspicuous. "'What have you heard recently?' demanded Gloria, her dignity going down before her curiosity. "'Well, for instance, that that party in Marietta killed Anthony's grandfather.' Instantly husband and wife were tense with annoyance. "'Why, I think that's outrageous.' "'That's what they say,' persisted Muriel stubbornly. Anthony paced the room. "'It's preposterous,' he declared. "'The very people we take on at parties shout the story around as a great joke.' and eventually it gets back to us in some such form as this. Gloria began running her finger through a stray reddish curl. Muriel licked her veil as she considered her next remark. You ought to have a baby. Gloria looked up wearily. We can't afford it. All the people in the slums have them, said Muriel triumphantly. Anthony and Gloria exchanged a smile. They had reached the stage of violent quarrels that were never made up, quarrels that smoldered and broke out again at intervals, or died away from sheer indifference. But this visit of Muriel's drew them temporarily together. When the discomfort under which they were living was remarked upon by a third party, it gave them the impetus to face this hostile world together. It was very seldom now that the impulse toward reunion sprang from within. Anthony found himself associating his own existence with that of the apartment's night elevator man, a pale, scraggly-bearded person of about sixty, with an air of being somewhat above his station. It was probably because of this quality that he had secured the position. It made him a pathetic and memorable figure of failure. Anthony recollected, without humor, a hoary jest about the elevator man's career being a matter of ups and downs. It was, at any rate, an enclosed life of infinite dreariness. Each time Anthony stepped into the car, he waited breathlessly for the old man's well, I guess we're going to have some sunshine today. Anthony thought how little rain or sunshine he would enjoy, shut into that close little cage in the smoke-colored, windowless hall. A darkling figure, he attained tragedy in leaving the life that had used him so shabbily. Three young gunmen came in one night, tied him up, and left him on a pile of coal in the cellar while they went through the trunk room. When the janitor found him the next morning, he had collapsed from chill. He died of pneumonia four days later. He was replaced by a glib Martinique negro, 
with an incongruous British accent and a tendency to be surly, whom Anthony detested. The passing of the old man had approximately the same effect on him that the kitten story had had on Gloria. He was reminded of the cruelty of all life, and in consequence of the increasing bitterness of his own. He was writing, and in earnest at last. He had gone to Dick and listened for a tense hour to an elucidation of those minutiae of procedure which hitherto he had rather scornfully looked down upon. He needed money immediately. He was selling bonds every month to pay their bills. Dick was frank and explicit. So, as far as articles on literary subjects and these obscure magazines go, you couldn't make enough money to pay your rent. Of course, if a man has the gift of humor, or a chance at a big biography or some specialized knowledge, he may strike it rich. But for you, fiction's the only thing. You say you need money right away? I certainly do. Well, it'd be a year and a half before you'd make any money out of a novel. Try some popular short stories. And, by the way, unless they're exceptionally brilliant, they have to be cheerful and on the side of the heaviest artillery to make you any money. Anthony thought of Dick's recent output, which had been appearing in a well-known monthly. It was concerned chiefly with the preposterous actions of a class of sawdust effigies who, one was assured, were New York society people, and it turned, as a rule, upon questions of the heroine's technical purity, with mock sociological overtones about the mad antics of the four hundred. "'But your stories!' exclaimed Anthony aloud, almost involuntarily. "'Oh, that's different,' Dick asserted astoundingly. "'I have a reputation, you see, so I'm expected to deal with strong themes.' Anthony gave an interior start realizing with this remark how much Richard Caramel had fallen off. Did he actually think these amazing latter productions were as good as his first novel? Anthony went back to the apartment and set to work. He found that the business of optimism was no mean task. After half a dozen futile starts, he went to the public library and for a week investigated the files of a popular magazine. Then, better equipped, he accomplished his first story— the dictaphone of fate. It was founded upon one of his few remaining impressions of that six weeks in Wall Street the year before. It purported to be the sunny tale of an office boy who, quite by accident, hummed a wonderful melody into the dictaphone. The cylinder was discovered by the boss's brother, a well-known producer of musical comedy, and then immediately lost. The body of the story was concerned with the pursuit of the missing cylinder, and the eventual marriage of the noble office boy, now a successful composer, to Miss Rooney, the virtuous stenographer who was half Joan of Arc and half Florence Nightingale. He had gathered that this was what the magazines wanted. He offered, in his protagonists, the customary denizens of the pink and blue literary world, immersing them in a saccharine plot that would offend not a single stomach in Marietta. He had it typed in double space, this last as advised by a booklet, Success as a Writer Made Easy by R. Meggs Whittlestein, which assured the ambitious plumber of the futility of perspiration, since, after a six-lesson course, he could make at least a thousand dollars a month. After reading it to a bored Gloria, and coaxing from her the immemorial remark that it was better than a lot of stuff that gets published, he satirically affixed the nom de plume of Gilles de Sade, and enclosed the proper return envelope, and sent it off. Following the gigantic labor of conception, he decided to wait until he heard from the first story before beginning another. Dick had told him that he might get as much as two hundred dollars. If by any chance it did happen to be unsuited, the editor's letter would, no doubt, give him an idea of what changes should be made. "'It is without question the most abominable piece of writing in existence,' said Anthony. The editor quite conceivably agreed with him. He returned the manuscript with a rejection slip." Anthony sent it off elsewhere and began another story. The second one was called The Little Open Doors. It was written in three days. It concerned the occult. An estranged couple were brought together by a medium in a vaudeville show. There were six altogether, six wretched and pitiable efforts to write down by a man who had never before made a consistent effort to write at all. Not one of them contained a spark of vitality, and their total yield of grace and felicity was less than that of an average newspaper column. 
During their circulation, they collected, all told, 31 rejection slips, headstones for the packages that he would find lying like dead bodies at his door. In mid-January, Gloria's father died, and they went again to Kansas City, a miserable trip, for Gloria brooded interminably, not upon her father's death, but on her mother's. Russell Gilbert's affairs having been cleared up, they came into possession of about three thousand dollars and a great amount of furniture. This was in storage, for he had spent his last days in a small hotel. It was due to his death that Anthony made a new discovery concerning Gloria. On the journey east, she disclosed herself, astonishingly, as a billfist. Why, Gloria, he cried, you don't mean to tell me that you believe that stuff. Well, she said defiantly, why not? Because it's, it's fantastic. You know that in every sense of the word you're an agnostic. You'd laugh at any orthodox form of Christianity, and then you come out with the statement that you believe in some silly rule of reincarnation. What if I do? I've heard you and Maury, and everyone else for whose intellect I have the slightest respect, agree that life as it appears is utterly meaningless, but it's always seemed to me that if I were unconsciously learning something here, it might not be so meaningless. You're not learning anything. You're just getting tired. And if you must have a faith to soften things, take up one that appeals to the reason of someone, besides a lot of hysterical women. A person like you oughtn't to accept anything unless it's decently demonstrable. I don't care about truth. I want some happiness. Well, if you've got a decent mind, the second has got to be qualified by the first. Any simple soul can delude himself with mental garbage. I don't care, she held out stoutly. And what's more, I'm not propounding any doctrine. The argument faded off, but reoccurred to Anthony several times thereafter. It was disturbing to find this old belief, evidently assimilated from her mother, inserting itself again under its immemorial disguise as an innate idea. They reached New York in March, after an expensive and ill-advised week spent in hot springs, and Anthony resumed his abortive attempts at fiction. As it became plainer to both of them that escape did not lie in the way of popular literature, there was a further slipping of their mutual confidence and courage. A complicated struggle went on incessantly between them. All efforts to keep down expenses died away from sheer inertia, and by March they were again using any pretext as an excuse for a party. With an assumption of recklessness, Gloria tossed out the suggestion that they should take all their money and go on a real spree while it lasted. Anything seemed better than to see it go in unsatisfactory driblets. Gloria, you want parties as much as I do. It doesn't matter about me. Everything I do is in accordance with my ideas, to use every minute of these years, when I'm young, in having the best time I possibly can. How about after that? After that I won't care. Yes, you will. Well, I may, but I won't be able to do anything about it, and I'll have had my good time. You'll be the same, then. After a fashion, we have had our good time, raised the devil, and we're in the state of paying for it. Nevertheless, the money kept going. There would be two days of gaiety, two days of moroseness, an endless, almost invariable round. The sharp pull-ups, when they occurred, resulted usually in a spurt of work for Anthony, while Gloria, nervous and bored, remained in bed or else chewed abstractedly at her fingers. After a day or so of this, they would make an engagement, and then, oh, what did it matter? This night, this glow, the cessation of anxiety, and the sense that, if living was not purposeful, it was, at any rate, essentially romantic. Wine gave a sort of gallantry to their own failure. Meanwhile, the suit progressed slowly, with interminable examinations of witnesses and marshallings of evidence. The preliminary proceedings of settling the estate were finished. Mr. Haight saw no reason why the case should not come up for trial before summer. Blockman appeared in New York late in March, he had been in England for nearly a year on matters connected with films par excellence. The process of general refinement was still in progress. Always he dressed a little better, his intonation was mellower, and in his manner there was perceptibly more assurance that the fine things of the world were his by a natural and inalienable right. He called to the apartment, remained only an hour, 
during which he talked chiefly of the war, and left telling them he was coming again. On his second visit, Anthony was not at home, but an absorbed and excited Gloria greeted her husband later in the afternoon. Anthony, she began, would you still object if I went in the movies? His whole heart hardened against the idea. As she seemed to recede from him, if only in threat, her presence became again not so much precious as desperately necessary. Oh, Gloria, Blockhead said he'd put me in, only if I'm ever going to do anything I'll have to start now. They only want young women. Think of the money, Anthony. For you, yes, but how about me? Don't you know that anything I have is yours too? It's such a hell of a career, he burst out, the moral, the infinitely circumspect Anthony, and such a hell of a bunch, and I'm so utterly tired of that fellow Blockman coming here and interfering. I hate theatrical things. It isn't theatrical. It's utterly different. What am I supposed to do? Chase you all over the country? Live on your money? Then make some yourself. The conversation developed into one of the most violent quarrels they had ever had. After the ensuing reconciliation and the inevitable period of moral inertia, she realized that he had taken the life out of the project. Neither of them ever mentioned the probability that Blockman was by no means disinterested, but they both knew that it lay back of Anthony's objection. In April, war was declared with Germany. Wilson and his cabinet, a cabinet that, in its lack of distinction, was strangely reminiscent of the Twelve Apostles, let loose the carefully starved dogs of war, and the press began to whoop hysterically against the sinister morals, sinister philosophy, and sinister music produced by the Teutonic temperament. Those who fancied themselves particularly broad-minded made the exquisite distinction that it was only the German government which aroused them to hysteria. The rest were worked up to a condition of retching indecency. Any song which contained the word mother and the word Kaiser was assured of a tremendous success. At last, every one had something to talk about, and almost every one fully enjoyed it, as though they had been cast for parts in a somber and romantic play. Anthony, Maury, and Dick sent in their applications for officers' training camps, and the two latter went about feeling strangely exalted and reproachless. They chattered to each other, like college boys, of wars being the one excuse for, and justification of, the aristocrat, and conjured up an impossible cast of officers, to be composed, it appeared, chiefly of the more attractive alumni of three or four eastern colleges. It seemed to Gloria that, In this huge red light streaming across the nation, even Anthony took on a new glamour. The 10th Infantry, arriving in New York from Panama, were escorted from saloon to saloon by patriotic citizens to their great bewilderment. West Pointers began to be noticed for the first time in years, and the general impression was that everything was glorious, but not half so glorious as it was going to be pretty soon and that everybody was a fine fellow, and every race a great race, always excepting the Germans, and in every strata of society, outcasts and scapegoats had but to appear in uniform to be forgiven, cheered, and wept over by relatives, ex-friends, and utter strangers. Unfortunately, a small and precise doctor decided that there was something the matter with Anthony's blood pressure. He could not conscientiously pass him for an officer's training camp. The Broken Lute Their third anniversary passed, uncelebrated, unnoticed. The season warmed in thaw, melted into hotter summer, simmered and boiled away. In July, the will was offered for probate, and upon the contestation was assigned by the surrogate to trial term for trial. The matter was prolonged into September. There was difficulty in impaneling an unbiased jury because of the moral sentiments involved. To Anthony's disappointment, a verdict was finally returned in favor of the testator, whereupon Mr. Haight caused a notice of appeal to be served upon Edward Shuttleworth. As the summer waned, Anthony and Gloria talked of the things they were to do when the money was theirs, and of the places they were to go after the war when they would agree on things again, for both of them looked forward to a time when love, springing like the phoenix from its own ashes, should be born again in its mysterious and unfathomable haunts. He was drafted early in the fall, 
and the examining doctor made no mention of low blood pressure. It was all very purposeless and sad when Anthony told Gloria one night that he wanted, above all things, to be killed. But, as always, they were sorry for each other for the wrong things at the wrong times. They decided that, for the present, she was not to go with him to the southern camp where his contingent was ordered. She would remain in New York to use the apartment, to save money, and to watch the progress of the case, which was pending now in the appellate division, of which the calendar, Mr. Haight told them, was far behind. Almost their last conversation was a senseless quarrel about the proper division of the income. At a word, either would have given it all to the other. It was typical of the muddle and confusion of their lives that, on the October night when Anthony reported at Grand Central Station for the journey to camp, she arrived only in time to catch his eye over the anxious heads of a gathered crowd. Through the dark light of the enclosed train sheds, their glances stretched across a hysterical area, foul with yellow sobbing, and the smells of poor women. They must have pondered upon what they had done to one another, and each must have accused himself of drawing the somber pattern through which they were tracing tragically and obscurely. At the last, they were too far away for either to see the other's tears. End of Book 2, Chapter 3, Part 2 of 2